Yeah. Like they used to always say, can you hear me now? No, you all remember that commercial? Sprint? The guy used to travel all over the country and he would go around and everywhere he'd all of a sudden just stop in like some remote place and he'd have his phone like he's walking across the United States and he'd just stop and go, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? So, sorry, I, can't, I keep thinking of that every time I work with this stuff. And can you hear me? Can you hear me? And the mic on? Mic off? Mic on? Mic off? It's like the karate kid except with microphones, huh? So anyway, yeah, looking at this song, I mean, I think it's wonderful. You look at the, you know, sing and be happy. Well, isn't singing happy? Not always, is it? There's songs that at times, they're, they're solemn, they're kind of, you know, kind of heartfelt and serious, but most of the time, songs do something for us. They're pretty important to us. And this song was one that I think is so important to talking about what I'm going to deal with this morning, and that is negativity. Who hasn't struggled with it? And I know you're not holding up your hand, but I know you wouldn't because we all struggle with it, don't you? You'd say, no, I never struggle with negativity. All of us do. Negativity is such a powerful influence. It, it often overwhelms all the positive things that can be going on in your life and you just totally forget it. So it's simply, but it, the, th the thing here is it's an attitude. It's, it's not a... You know, it's not a car wreck. It's not some, you know, uh, headache. It's not something external. You notice it's attitude. It's a negative attitude. And, you know, we used to always, in the military, when I was in, <laughs> in Army basic training, you used to always tell us, boy, you need an attitude adjustment. Get down. Give me 40 push-ups. I guess they figured push-ups would fix my attitude. It did because I was terrible with them, and by the time I'm done, I didn't want to talk anyway or do anything. So, but it was, they, they wanted me to adjust our attitude. And so it's negative. It's unhelpful. It, it sucks the enthusiasm out. No excitement. You've seen it. You see people. Some people are stuck in that. And it really is. It's a vicious loop. It's a loop, and it's a cycle that we all go through. Now, there's, a, there's some parts to negativity that we need to have. You need to be cautious, you know, you need to be, you need to have some of that pessimism, I guess. And there are times to be real. Some people are too optimistic, maybe. You know, there can be extremes in being too positive and you miss the things that are obvious around you and you need to pay attention to. But it is, it starts out though, like the definition was an attitude, which is emotions, isn't it? I mean, you cop an attitude. When somebody says, nah, don't cop an attitude, and what's going on? It's... It's an emotional response, the way that you're, you're engaging with people and you're saying things and people are watching your interactions. It's something that way. And so it starts out with these thoughts that then create thoughts. And I want you to think about that, which then creates this kind of irrational thinking at times where we're not clear. We're not thinking exactly right now. And you don't know it either. That's kind of the issue. Is it sometimes? You, you don't know that it's irrational because you're not really observing and keen to what the source is of what your thoughts are. And they get overtaken and you just kind of flow so naturally into the circle. So it starts out with emotions. I got my feelings hurt. I got threatened. I got scared. You know, that's why the boogeyman still lives to this day. Because all you got to do is scare somebody. You'll see all sorts of things everywhere. Oh, that does play into what I'm talking about because it does start out with that idea of creating these emotions or having these emotions created and then it causes our thinking to go down a different trail. I, I've caught myself doing that when I mountain bike by myself at, in the dark after seeing a mountain lion out there. Yeah, by myself after I'd already seen one out there at night and so I'm, I'm riding along and I heard, I tell you, I heard it. It was this click, 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 and it was the fingernails, you know, the, the, the nails of a mountain lion just right behind me. I could hear it, click, click, because I was on this, this granite uh, path, and it was just all hard, like a sidewalk. And I'm going down through there, and I'm like hearing that, and I'm going, oh, he's there. And so I just slammed on the brakes. I figured, well, I'll catch him, and I stopped. And again, pitch black, you know, all by myself. It's dead quiet. And I look down. 
I broke a spoke. I broke a spoke. And the spoke was going, click, 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 click. Nearly killed myself. Because that wasn't a good spot where I decided to stop. I just knew that when I hit this one spot, he's probably going to catch me anyway. So I just stopped. So what started it? My thoughts. Not assuming the simple. Ron, there's something going on with your bike. No, I remember seeing this mountain lion like a week and a half early. And it's at night, so it's got to be a mountain lion. And then what happened? I started having this irrational thinking. It's got me in this idea of thinking about it. And then all of a sudden, it changed my behavior, didn't it? I slammed on my brakes and got ready to get eaten. I was ready to die. I was like, wow, you know, I guess I can grab him by the throat. I, I literally was. I was kind of planning on, well... You know, how can I stop this thing from eating me up? And then, and then it just kept going around because then I had more emotions because I thought about being eaten and the emotions of being eaten even terrified me more. And, you know, mountain bikers get eaten. I read about it on California. You know, they, they're snagging mountain bikers off trails and stuff. And so I just thought this is, I just kept going around until I looked down and I saw that broken spoke. Now, tell me you haven't done something like that. Now, that's funny. You know, I didn't get hurt. Taught me a lesson. But how many of those exact type of events that you have every day? Maybe it's not a mountain lion. Maybe it's a somebody said something at work thing or some stress that's going on or a new policy that's being put out by your employer. Or maybe... You're, you heard something about a family member that's now doing something. Or, you know, I mean, everything. And we go through this cycle. We do. And it, it's more than just the negativity. It's what is underneath it. So we know negative is just a bad, bad, you know, you don't, bad thoughts and such. But think about some of these emotions that come out. They create insecurity. I felt very insecure. You know, I felt very insecure. It, it creates sadness. Negativity creates sadness. Negativity, what else does it create? Well, it creates anger. You get mad about it. I got in from the fright to the fight moment where I was ready to fight that kitty cat, man. I was going to, you know, and I was. I was kind of, you know, but this happens too when we're gauging with our problems, with the things that we perceived that now we've developed some possibly incorrect thoughts and now emotionally it's driving us around the wheel and we become angry it develops bitterness I've seen a very close relative of mine they passed on extremely bitter and when I after I had looked at this I thought now I know Everything about their attitude was also extremely negative. Everything was negative. And then guilt. Guilt comes along, doesn't it? Guilt is the next thing that starts to come out. Shame. Kind of that shamefulness that builds up and starts to come out. All of these are emotions that cause us to be negative. They bring out the negativity. Disappointment. About something that may be just emotionally and perceived and not... Thought, like, you know, thought correctly. Remember that. That's the basis of a lot of the negativity. Now, I'm not taking away the real reason to be negative. I mean, your house blew up and burned to the ground. You're going to be depressed. You're going to be negative. I, I'm not talking about that type of stuff. I'm talking about 99% of the negativity that we develop. That's controllable. That's controllable. Which builds to worry. I, and anxiousness. Right? People who get anxious, these create or really a resultant of the negativity. Negativeness against something thought, perceived, but it comes out. Panic. I've, I've seen that happen. Panic. One time a Christian lady asked me the question. She said, do you think it's sinful to be anxious? And nervous and all the time 
And I, and I, you know, the first time I heard it, I said, is it sinful? And the first time I, you know, I said, no, well, you know, it's kind of, and I kind of just kind of like, you know, toned it down and no, not really. And, but the next time they brought it up, I said, yes, yes, it is. At the point where she was, what was happening to their lives? Yes. Because it was affecting her family. It was affecting her service to God. Her salvation was being affected. So yes, there, there is a point where negativity, I mean, look at all these emotions. Are any of these healthy? Now, I've, I've talked about the book, you know, about um, Dr. Zappali or something. He wrote a book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Do you think they get nervous? No. They have adrenaline, a fight or flight. When a zebra, you know, is attacked or chased by a lion, he just runs. He's not nervous. He goes, sits underneath a tree and chills out. He's not sitting there going, man, Bob the lion is going to be there tomorrow and I got to get right by him again. And then start feeling all those emotions as if he's being chased while he's just thinking about it. We can do that. That's the dangerous in that is that we can sit around and recreate the exact same horrible event and it's not even happening. The danger in that is some of the physiological impacts that it has on us that are extremely rare, real, real heart rate increases. And this person actually had some cardiac problems. Now, I'm not going to go to the point where it says that because I heard this wives tell that if a person got cancer, they, it was because they were hateful. And if a person had heart problems, it was because of they worry too much. And if nah. I'm not connecting that. That's, but there is people who are extremely nervous. Their heart rates are elevated. I've seen that as a paramedic. Some of that's natural. You know, I mean, you're, you're in a bad situation. And so the nervousness is going to increase your heart rate. But what does that increase to? Pressure. Doctor described it to me. He said, you know, you can take that so long, but it's like a garden hose that you left the sprinkler on or the, you know, under pressure and leave it out in the sun. After a while, what happens? That, that garden hose, it blows, develops cracks, it develops problems. And that's what happens. So you can see again, the physiological impact of what worrying does to us. Startle response. Now these aren't me, I didn't make these up. I pulled these off of some research. So I mean, but I think back about this same person I was referring to very, very, you, it didn't take much, you could startle them. And so the more I, I, I dwell about that, I think, wow. And, and this is one that's probably, you know, sleep. Sleep is severely impacted by it, by negativity, by all of these things. Look at what it does to us. It changes appetite and digestion. It causes people to have all sorts of digestive problems as well. You suppress the immune system, like what the doctor was talking about, then you don't realize that with those stress hormones that are created by negativity, one aspect that through this negativity is when it suppresses your immune system, your body is designed to provide what's essential under a threatening environment. So for example, digestive tract or live. Heart, brain, because I'm in a threatening environment, do I need blood to my heart? Do I need blood to my brain? Or do I need to digest that Twinkie I just ate and that donut? Which one? Your body knows, hey, get the blood to the brain, forget those other functions, and even your immune system. It's proven. Your immune system is even impacted by your negative attitude. Because your body goes, huh, why are we fixed? We're going to die. Hey, we got to run. We got to flee. Now, you may have a really good immune system, but you got to go down to the micro level. Those little bitty problems in your arteries that we don't ever notice or anything, we, we have them. Little ruptures, little things occur all the time in our body and our little immune system working. Not just when you get a cold. You see those things stop. And that little nick in that artery in your heart, in other places in your body, doesn't get healed. Guess what it does? Builds up. Stuff collects on it. 
you start getting collapse, you start getting plaque, you start getting hardening of arteries, you start you see the spiral. And again, it's so subtle. But it starts really with the negativity. It starts it out. We've seen also fatigue. People that are extremely negative and stressed and worry, exhausted, no energy. Why? Heart rate's accelerated, all this is going on, all those, those stress endorphin uh, uh, hormones are flooding the body. You see that. So overcome it. How do we overcome it? That's easier said than done, isn't it? And I'm not going to sit and tell you I know how to do it. I mean, no, I know it. I mean, I mean I'm not saying I've accomplished it perfectly. But I remember one day I was working in the emergency department at the hospital, and I walked up and I clocked out. And I had this thought, man, today was terrible. It was horrible. We had such a horrible day. The day I came to work, at the end of the day, I clocked out and I went to myself, man, it was an awesome day. And then I stopped and thought about it and I go, no, no, today was even worse. We had more trauma. We had more people dying. Day, and I just stopped and I'm staring and I'm going, how did I develop that emotion? How did I from the first, the day before, go to the time clock, finish the day and think yeah, it was such a horrible day. And then the next day was worse. I mean, measurably. But when I clocked out, I went, wow, what a great day it was. Isn't that weird? You know what the difference is? It's between your ears. It's right here. And I started thinking about that. And I thought, wow. So what it is, is, is my thinking right? Remember that vicious cycle. It starts out with emotion. Maybe I had eaten, maybe I didn't eat lunch today before. So my blood sugar was a little low. So when I went to clock out, you know, I wasn't feeling as well. And so I was under more stress. This is biblical, by the way. We're getting there. This really is. Because who knows our bodies better than our Father? And knows how to make our lives healthier and happier than our Creator Himself. So think about how, how you're processing information. You know, do I have it right? Is it really a mountain lion? Or could it be just my bike? What overrode that? It was just emotional. And by having those examples, what I think is incredible is now when I hear a strange noise and I still ride at night and I still ride out where that mountain lion is, I don't jump to mountain lion anymore. I learned a lot about mountain, I learned a lot about mountain lions and, and stuff like that. And I know my, now I go to thinking, oh man, did I break a spoke again? What's going on with my shifter or something else to try to explain it? And I don't know, man, I might come back around and go, nope, that's a cat. He's chasing me. But I consider it. You consider it. And that's what we have to do. We have to concentrate, you know, on, on what is good. That's the hard part, isn't it? Starting to move away from the natural. Uh, the world just swims in negativity. It is swimming in it. Thriving in it. There are people who thrive in it and people who will manipulate negativity to keep you negative. That's Satan. He wants you to do that because he knows that if you follow God, you'll have a solution. Because our father provides you a solution. And a part of that negativity thoughts is that if all this is happening to me, then there must not either be a God or I'm not right with God, but there's something wrong with God. We go there eventually, don't we? So let's reframe. Let's talk about how do we let God help us. So whenever we're starting to feel, when you start to feel negative, is reframe your thinking and come and start to focus upon God's word. As Christians, we proclaim that we believe our faith is based upon that we hear from God's word. But then we forget about Psalms like Psalms 139. And when's the last time you've read this verse? Psalms 139, starting in verse 32 or 23. Listen to why, how it's saying it. 
And not only maybe just read it, but thought through this and help you. See, that, that's where God's word is not helping you if we're not reading it. Look what he says. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any me and lead me in everlasting way. Expose what's happening to me, Lord. How many times you really want somebody to open you up like that? I want somebody to find all the hurtful things inside me. I want you to find all those things and then I want you to fix me. Usually we seal ourselves off. But that's the only way the Father's going to know is us being humble enough to honestly say to him, Lord, search my heart. Go through, help me. Look at why I'm anxious. The Father knows you're going to be anxious. He knows you're going to have negative times. But where are we going to resolve it in order to make our lives better? So the next part when we start to look at that overcoming negativity is, I think, going to Philippians where Paul very beautifully says, and you ought to hang this on your refrigerator, hang it on your door, put it in your car, memorize it, because I think he says it. He says, starting in, in Philippians 4, starting down in verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report. If there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. It's a great list. We hear this is another one where we, we hear. This. But that's not what we hear continuously through social media, is it? It's, it's not about the true. It doesn't matter. So now you, you can't trust what is true. But a lot of people dwell on that stuff, don't they? They don't care if it's true or not. It needs to be true. And that's something he says. Dwell on what is true, not the negativity, not the falseness. Dwell on the things that are honorable. And that's why, again, it's so difficult in our country today because of all the things that are coming at us. No matter how or who you are or what your values are, you know, all of us are being slaughtered with it, aren't we? Things that aren't honorable. Why do they talk about it? You know, they tried, you know, if you'll think about it, good news does not sell. Years ago in the 60s or somewhere, they tried to actually produce a newspaper that was just good news. That was it. They would never publish anything that was, you know, terrible, ugly, went bankrupt. Nobody would buy it. Talk about gore. Look at the clickbait on your Facebook page, right? Oh, they love that. They know they'll get you on that one. And you'll go and you'll look. Gawkers, when we're driving down the highway and we see something happen that's really gory, we want to, we, what is it about that? Stop. <laughs> Stop dwelling on this stuff. Dwell on what is honorable, what is right. These are kind of reinforcing some of the same concepts. What is pure? What is lovely? What is of a good reputation? Excellence in anything that is decent. And that is a hard list to find and stay on, isn't it? Sounds great. Sounds beautiful. But it's hard for us. And it, but that's why I say it takes a reframing of our thinking. When you catch yourself doing the opposite of focusing on the, this list, stop. It's going to take you down a very unhealthy, spiritually unhealthy, and a very physically unhealthy path. And on top of that, who likes to honestly hang out with negative people? You know one. The sad part is, if you may even be one. 
And you don't like to hang out with them. I know negative people who don't like to hang out with negative people. What's that about? I heard somebody that was a negative person just really ripping on this other negative person. And I was just wanting so much to go. Oh, you need a mirror. I, I, I should have said something, but I was just so overtaken by the fact that this person was so negative themselves. And they're blasting this other person about how negative they are. So don't step too far away from this. You could be that negative person and you don't want to hang out. That means you wouldn't even want to hang out with yourself, which goes back to some of the emotional problems that it creates when we have that, right? So not dwelling on these things. Gain peace through God's word. It really is that simple. It's not going to be the word on Facebook. It's not going to be the word in the media. It's not going to be in some philosophy. It's going to be in God's word. And you have to go and get it. You're going to have to do it. Do you want to be negative? Well, then carry on. But I don't think most people, one, realize that they are sick until they go to a doctor or until it's too late. Or they don't realize you're, ne you're, you're so negative until somehow it's exposed to you. Did you realize? Maybe sometimes that, that irrational thinking in that loop gets blown apart because reality steps in and shows you. Like that spoke on my bike. Then all of a sudden, like, whoa. I hope you have some of those moments to start to catch yourself, to reframe your thinking and help to bring you out of that depressing negativity that seems to just get us all the time. Look what he also says at the last part of this in Philippians. These things you have heard and received, you have learned and received and heard and seen where? In Paul. Now, I've never seen him. I've never met Paul. But I tell you what, read his letters. <laughs> read his history of what he went through. Stoned. I mean, literally, not with drugs. I mean, stoned physically and left for dead and drug out of the city. Beaten with rods, thrown in prison. I mean, he's got this amazing list, doesn't he? And this letter right here, Philippians, you know where it's written? Sitting in a prison cell in Rome, awaiting trial before Nero. How can you have a good attitude about defending yourself, about you being a Roman, yet you're a Jew? which they considered you were atheistic, and you're even worse because you're a troublemaker. There was really no hope for Paul to make that out of that meeting with Nero alive. There really wasn't. And yet, in Philippians, he was so uplifting and encouraging others. We have people like that around us, and I think that's what we have to do. We have to look at them. Look at them. Model and see, you think that there's just nothing going on wrong in their lives? That's why they're always positive? No, you need to look deeper. But those are the ones we want to be around. Those are the ones, like Paul says, model after me. And one of the greater ones, again, is the redefining and understanding and modeling ourselves about the way we love. Notice I've been on the hobby horse with this because I think this is the foundation of many of our problems. Look what he says. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails. All those miracles he said are going to fail, but that does not fail. Doesn't that, does this not sound like the list that Paul said dwell upon? It does. And this also will give you the result in to what Paul also said in Philippians is there is a peace that surpasses all understanding that he was able to obtain. 
And he wrote that in the same letter when he was sitting in prison, awaiting pretty much his death. The Lord delivered him, but he didn't know it was going to happen. So to me, that's the most powerful thing is that he says he obtained this peace. He's saying, think on these positive things. He says, look at my life. Now, there's that negative person who read that letter and said, yeah, yeah, Paul, where are you at right now? You're sitting in prison waiting to be executed because you're going to go before that crazy guy Nero. How would you respond to a letter like that? I would be amazed. It would give me such strength to know that a person in that condition can be so positive about what's happening in their lives. Break the cycle. And it's got to start with you. Break the cycle. I found this from Jim Morton. It's the author of ready are he says the cycle of god the good is broken by a single act of negativity the cycle of negativity is stopped by choosing the good not just once but again and again until it's goodness that prevails in your life and in our world altogether last part because you see we're a part of the total picture of our we affect our families in relationships with our negativity or positivity it affects in the people at your work it affects our country and that's why I liked it and he said not just once he says again and again and again and that's how you'll change yourself first those around you and if there's enough that is doing this it can change a country it can change So positivity is honestly the key to finding that ability to see the gospel and the love and the positive and the message that's in it. Negativity keeps you away. It, it, that's what you know, keeps people from wanting to accept the conditions that there's something wrong with me or I need to change something. And they, they push back. Being positive is focusing upon the good side of what God is trying to bring to you. What God is offering to you. It's not an escape plan from, from eternal punishment. It's a plan of salvation. It's a plan of beautiful, eternal life with Him. But it has to always start with the individual. God has always given us a choice. So this morning, the choice is yours. Continue to let negativity rule at times or bring it under captivity and improve your life and have a more healthy and a more spiritual life with God. Let the love of God dwell in you. Follow after the apostles. Look at what the scriptures teach us. And I think you're going to see the impact that's there. You know, people, help, self-help books are number one in making billions of dollars. The Bible is still like the number one seller around. Why? It's not just about getting salvation, but it's also because of how positive it can have on our lives. So if there's something we can do to help you in your relationship with him, bringing peace between you and your creator, if there's something we can do to either initial, initiate that by being baptized and having your sins forgiven and being brought into the body of Christ, or pray with you, help you if you've already become a Christian because we're going to struggle. But I hope that maybe you'll be able to reframe and start to identify negativity as well in your life. If there's anything else we can do to help you, let us know when we stand and sing.